Okay, start Syami. Okay. Alright. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to all distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Muhammad Syami Mak Miswan, the, uh, the moderator for this session. So, uh, I would like to welcome you all to this presentation. Uh, in this occasion, we will have a presentation from our speaker, Mr. Sunil Hasmukharif for an entitled Reinventing yourself to be future ready. Five secrets of highly employable. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will have a short Q&A session at the end of our session. For those who have a question regarding the presentation, you can leave a comment. Uh, then we will deliver the question to the speaker after the presentation. Uh, before we start, before the presentation begins, Allow me to briefly introduce our speaker for today. Mr. Sunil Hasmukhare uh, currently works as a chief strategist at HC Consult Consultants Groups. He also a president at Malaysia Association of Professional Trainers and Coaches, president at Malaysia Positive Psychology Association, director Global Trainers Federation and founder ASEAN Corporate Happiness Culture community. Mr. Sunil Hasmukhere had an experience which patronized also as a senior executive in project management. Also, he has a background study in Bachelor of Engineering and MBA in International Business. So, quiet and experienced person that he will share with us today. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Sunil Hasmukhere to deliver his speech. So, Mr. Sunil, uh, you, the floor is yours now. All right. Thank you very much, Shazmi. I really appreciate your very heartwarming introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you so much for having me to share on this very interesting topic called the reinventing yourself to be future ready. Now, what do I mean by this? Right, As 2020 ended, it began to struck me that if we do not change ourselves, if we do not do something different, then we will no longer be relevant and we'll have difficulties in actually getting employability, difficulties in overcoming the challenges where we are in, and difficulties in wanting to be able to grow, but yet not being able to grow. You'll be in a very difficult situation because we are not willing to reinvent ourselves. So reinventing ourselves and everything begins with us, right? Everything begins with us. So if we are willing to reinvent ourselves to become ready for the future, then the opportunities are in abundance. The question is, how much are we willing to shift? How much are we willing to switch? How much are we willing to change, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, just a very quick, um, you know, introduction about me as what he mentioned. Been working in Petronas for 10 years after getting a scholarship from Petronas. Had the best experience learning and growing with some of the country's top leaders. And then I decided to pursue my passion in the areas of training, coaching and consultancy. Right. Was blessed with lots of opportunities with lots of you know, um, global experiences because I had the privilege and honor of being invited by United Nations to speak when I was first 17 years old. And ever since then, I've traveled to more than 46 countries, addressed more than 150,000 people around the world. The only year which I've never traveled as much as I would normally do is 2020. I only went to Slovenia and I only went to India for two different conferences and that's it, I was stuck. And I'm here now speaking to people around the world using three different computers and laptops, right? Not exactly the best experience, but hey, you know what? Agility is the key. Being able to do things differently is what we need to do in order to survive. Let's just reflect for a moment on the effects of COVID-19 
right where situation in the country is really really in in a very we are in a very challenging time because we have got the global health crisis we have got economic crisis we have got political changes that is happening right just couple of hours ago an announcement was made where there is going to be you know a uh, fasa satu darurat in the country then yesterday there was an announcement that there is going to be uh, mco which basically means you and i can't even go to office right we are supposed to work from home as much as possible to to break the chain of covid so we are in this you know funny environment you know because we are not able to move and go on with life the way we normally would unemployment rate right which used to be at about 3.3 3.4% has now gone up to all the way about 5% right million people have lost their jobs and graduates are not able to pursue uh, their dreams of getting the jobs that they have always wanted so let's really become real because i have two options in every talk that i do one to give you the sugar coated dialogues facts and evidences which makes you feel so good and wow you know everything seems to be rosy and all that or second to really put up the mirror and show you the hard facts and i often choose the second because when we become more and more authentic when we become more and more real and we start acknowledging the reality of life the faster we are able to accept it the faster we will be able to do something different to move forward in life right this is 2016 if i'm not mistaken 15 16 where massive retrenchments started to take place in big companies right you have never heard of big organizations retrenching them prior to that but they had no choice but to actually retrench people so we are in this very interesting scenario like i repeatedly said and if you notice i don't use the word difficult scenario i think we are in a very interesting scenario simply because i like to look at this as an opportunity for us to do things differently right one study six in 2015 says that more than 400000 you know young malaysians are unemployed and 88% of the young people are earning below 1500 ringgit right this is 2020 right malaysia's jobless rate expected to remain high until mid 2021 right right now we are at the state where you know in october last year that we have about 750000 people who are their jobs more than 500 malaysians are entering the workforce however there is at least 1 million job seekers this year in 2020 and 2021 who is looking for jobs so we this i think this is one of the best times in our life if you look at it from a positive lens but a question often gets asked to me sunil what do you think are the reasons behind why we have you know difficulties in getting employment why is it that we have you know all the capabilities we have got our first class honors we have got our second class upper yet we are not getting jobs now let me tell you this my dear brothers and sisters while you think that getting a degree is going to be the most important thing in your life let me tell you as time is changing as economy is changing as the world is now changing we are coming to a point where big organizations like amazon right are willing to hire people even without a degree right we have got organizations like google who are looking at young people and seeing if they have got certain skills to be absorbed into the organization and not really bothered so much about the paper qualification what's the point i'm trying to make here number 1 while you and i rejoice that our paper qualifications are there we have achieved great heights after all the struggles during our degree programs and all that heartiest congratulations well done point number 2 is that all definitely not right a lot of different set of skills are needed at this point of time so that you and i will be able to be relevant to still be people who is wanted in the organization space and very interesting job street has done a research and this research ties very well to some of the points that i'd like to share with you 
right? Top five reasons why fresh graduates don't get hired, right? Number one is asking for unrealistic salaries and benefits. Let me not go very far. Let's not even go into, you know, me hiring people or, you know, sort of recommending people to work in Petronas. Even in my own organization, HC Consultants Group of Companies, right? I have young people who say they want to work with me, all right, because they probably got inspired by some of the work that we do. And I am so excited and happy to give opportunities, right, to my young brothers and sisters to say, hey, come and work with me. Let's do stuff together. Let's grow together, right? Let me tell you, last year, I interviewed 42 people. And out of 42 people, I eventually hired two people. One person came into the organization with all the promises in the world. Mr. Sunil, I promise to do this, 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 this. I want to do this. And I don't normally dictate because I advocate coaching. So in conversations, I get you to say what you want to do. I align it to the organization's goal and I empower you to do. A privilege that you will never probably get in a lot of the organizations. Give them opportunity. And less than one month later, when another organization gave the same young man a 400 ringgit salary difference, he decides to leave. But mind you, the reason he wanted to work with me was one, he gets the privilege of working from home to take care of his mother who was dying of cancer. Number two, he was able to be with the mom and have, you know, this super flexible working hours. Again, what he wanted, we gave. However, when another job opportunity with 400 ringgit extra salary came all the way in Port Klang, which makes him travel for about two hours, two and a half hours, one way, he decided to go. And less than two weeks later, he calls me and saying, Mr. Sunil, I regret leaving you. I'm losing all the flexibility. I'm now working for about 16 hours a day. I'm really exhausted. Can you please hire me back again? Why am I sharing this story with you, my dear friends? Is because one, you have been given whatever you had requested and dreamt for. However, the appreciation and grabbing of opportunities to grow in the opportunity that is given is missing. Two, unrealistic salaries are being demanded. A fresh graduate comes up to me and says, to work with you, I would like, so I ask the question, how much would you like to be paid? And he immediately comes back and tells me, I would love to get at least a 6,500 ringgit salary. I nearly jumped out of my seat, right? I took nine, sorry, seven years of working in Petronas before I think I touched a 6,500 ringgit salary benchmark, right? And for somebody to come in and immediately demand something so big, perfectly fine. But tell me what is going to be the return on investment? What is the benefit that, you know, the organization would get upon being willing to hire you for that kind of salary? So the immediate next question I asked this young man was, I'm okay to sign off your 6,500 ringgit salary, but tell me every month, how much sales are you going to bring in? Um, I think I can bring in about 20,000 ringgit sales. I think I can do this. I think, I think, I think. A reverse strategy to that would have been, come in, show your value, show what sort of you know credentials you are able to create and bring to the organization and then you request for anything that you want but here it was the opposite right poor common of english i guess we have to accept the fact that in the business world english is a language that is commonly used and if we want to support organizations to grow globally then speaking decent amount on English, it's very, very important. 60% of people remain unemployed because they are choosy about the company. It's always a dream to work for the top 100 or the Fortune 100 companies. But how many people get an opportunity immediately? Why not explore the possibilities of working in smaller organizations because in smaller organizations, you get the chance to do more than rather in a big organization where you do a small little scope, right? Think of it from a positive perspective 
go into any opportunity that comes, especially now in this challenging time, whatever job opportunity comes, grab it, get the experience, keep accumulating your wealth of experience and sharpen your skills further. And then you move every two years, every three years. And that would be ideal, right? Poor communication skills, poor attitude and character it has become because as I spend more and more time, you know, being with the HR leaders in the country, a lot of them share that young people today, these exact words coming from some of the leaders, yeah, young people today, while they have got the skills, they seem to have, you know, that attitude that they are privileged, where we must now, you know, really reach out to them, we must really... Uh, Kautau to them, that was the word that was used, right? Because they have information. My opinion in defense of the young people is young people have the experience of the knowledge and have access to information, which is critical, right? But the attitude of not wanting to persevere, scroll a little bit, immediately want to leave the job. There's one person that I know um, went into the organization had a bit of an argument with the manager because manager demanded certain amount of, you know, uh, quality in the report that was being prepared. This person got so upset and angry, he threw a 24-hour resignation, took a legal, uh, what do you call, action against the boss for demanding a better quality to be prepared. Now, my dear friends, as a manager, as a leader, and who is paying, you know, salaries, they would expect you to be able to serve them and do a decent amount of work. Be open to feedback, right? And that is something that is missing, right? Being willing to accept feedback, being willing to take criticisms for the betterment. It's not something that people are comfortable with today. So these are some of the real critical things which I think if we were to shift Right, and relook at the way we've been looking at way the way we've been, you know, hoping that our bosses would treat us, hoping that the employment market would be, you might find that there is some opportunities or the other. A lot of young people are graduating. That's a known fact. What makes you unique? What makes you different? What makes you so special, right? When you come into an organization. Right. Let me narrate another good example. A couple of years back, while in Petronas, my senior manager asked me to identify four people, right, to be hired in our department as our department was expanding. Now, I had about 300 CVs that was put by the secretary on my table. And in between my travels, there was one particular morning I went into office at 6.30. I spent about half an hour reviewing the 300 CVs. And in less than 20 minutes, all I did is to throw away about 280 CVs, 20 CVs I selected, put it on the table of my secretary and told her you can arrange for interview sessions when you see you know, windows available in my schedule. As we went on, the process of interviewing, within the week where I interviewed 18 people, 17 of them were almost a no-go for very simple reasons. Reasons like what? No simple, good morning, can I please come in, knocking the door. When you ask the question, so tell me a little bit more about yourself. Um, I'm not sure what to tell you about myself. Little things can turn your interviewer off. And these were not bad quality people. Yeah, these were people with second class upper, first class honors. Out of 20 CVs, eventually my team, we hired one person. And this one person was actually a second class lower, which was not supposed to be the reference that I was given by the HR. Right? And I then went on to defend to my senior leader that, hey, you know what? This person will be able to deliver he is truly an asset to the organization. Trust me, he will do well. 
And one of the greatest reasons why I chose him together with two other colleagues of mine is because he was involved with so many different clubs and societies, doing so many different kind of volunteerism work. And all that experiences that he had accumulated made him somebody so reliable, made him someone filled with experience, made him someone which had a lot of experience in managing people, which was one of the skills that we were looking for. So competitive advantage would always be there if you had done volunteerism work, if you have been involved, you know, helping other communities, doing lots of different things, right? Academic achievements is important, but sincerely not everything as the world that we are progressing in, right? Involved in co-curricular activities and doing volunteerism stuff. The key here is to be hungry to get so many different kind of skills that you will be able to show as experience. One person that I was having a conversation with or rather a career coaching conversation with told me this, Mrs. Sunil, if employers don't give us the fresh graduates an opportunity, how are we going to have working experience? My dear friends, when we use the word working experience, what is it that we are looking for in a CV? We are looking to really understand based on the work experience that you have done, what sort of competencies do you have? What sort of skills do you have? What sort of social skills do you have? What sort of soft skills do you have, right? So not necessary that that can be projected merely through a full-fledged employment. It could also be reflected through your volunteerism work, through your social engagements, through your involvement in different clubs and societies and co-curricular activities. So that is the key. And that was the main reason why this young gentleman who came for the interview out of 300, I selected 20 out of 20, I only picked one, happens to be a second class lower, but has got a four page CV filled with all all the different volunteerism activities and clubs and societal experiences that he put and he could share stories he could share experiences he could demonstrate his skills to all of us and that is exactly what we want to do all right be able to project that and very interestingly while i thought that was the way forward right um, and the only reason i thought that was the way is because that's how my father who is a teacher encouraged me while I got my scholarship in UTP to study in University of Engineering Petronas, I spent at least 80% of my time not studying only, but also being active in different clubs and societies. Almost every single club and society in the university, I was involved, right? Whether I was a volunteer or a committee member, a leader or an advisor, it doesn't matter, but I was actually involved with almost every single club and society. And that gave me so much of experience, exposure, opportunities, right? And sharpened a lot of my skills, which today, by just reading books and good and getting good results, is not going to give you, right? Very interesting enough, Harvard did a research together with the Carnegie Foundation and Stanford Research Center, which concluded that 85% of your job success, my job success, comes from well-developed soft skills and people skills. And 15% of the job success will come from technical knowledge and hard skills. You may be a mechanical engineering graduate, but in today's internet of things era or digitalization era, that particular skills may not be necessary for upskilling, and reskilling so that you will be able to develop new skill sets that will help you achieve that technical skills. However, the soft skills, people management skills, you can continuously be accumulating, which will become very handy when you want to apply for a job. So my dear friends, change is the only constant in life. Whether we like it or not, we are in a situation where we have to be able to embrace change and be willing to do things differently.
differently. We cannot continue living in our comfort zones, hoping for some organization to discover that, hey, in this kampung, there is one particular young person who deserves to be given a job. No, there is a lot of effort that you and I need to put in in order to secure opportunities, right? Then the question comes, what is the shift are you talking about? What is the kind of skills that we are looking for? So my dear friends, the word skilling and upskilling are two different things. Upskilling is basically advancing within your current function, within your current skill set. Meaning if you were trained as a lawyer, right? then you are now furthering your knowledge, enhancing your knowledge in the area of the legal world. Reskilling, for an example, would simply be where you are trained to be a lawyer. However, you are having difficulty getting a legal job. You now suddenly find that you enjoy doing a lot of this Instagram posting and Facebook posting and LinkedIn posting and all that. And suddenly you realize that that kind of skill that you have and, and the passion of you know uploading stuff and writing content may give you another skill set which you already have through your passion but what you will do now is to go for a program like for example digital marketing course when you go for a digital marketing certification or a course you will now learn this new how to do digital marketing how to do seo how to do all that stuff right and that is exactly what reskilling would help you to do. So you may be a graduate from law. However, because of the circumstances, because of newer, you know, change and directions that's happening in the world, right? You jump into getting a new skill set and you are able to now work as a digital marketing executive, as a content development specialist. Right, so please be mindful of the two different terminologies. One is called upskilling, and one is called um, reskilling. Job demands, right, is going to be much lesser in years to come, right, because 85 million jobs may be displaced because of technology, because of equipments, because of you know all these different uh, machineries that is coming in, all right? Now, what is really interesting is, while there is going to be a change in human capital, there is also a great opportunity where, you know, the research by, you know, the World Economic Forum says, 97 million jobs will be created to accommodate demand for new roles, especially those where humans will partner the machines. So now the question is, you know that that is how the future looks like. What is it that you and I can do to reinvent ourselves? What is it that we can do to make sure that we are ready for the change that is coming, right? And these are some of the top 10 um, jobs, skills that the World Economic Forum has listed. Number one, data analysis and scientists. Number two, AI and machine learning specialists. Three, digital marketing, sorry, big data specialists. Four, digital marketing and strategy specialists. Five, process automation professionals. Six, business development. Whether you have a machine or whether you have AI or not, you still need people to go out there and do business development. So that's one good example of how business development will be an evergreen, um, you know, skills that you need or job that you will always have, right? Digital transformation managers, information security analysts, software and app developers, internet of things specialists. So these are some of the key skills that is needed. These are some of the jobs that's going to be available in abundance by 2025 even if you see now a lot of organizations are starting to hire data analysts ai specialists digital marketing people business development experts software and app developers and all that so the question is are you ready and are you already having the skills 
and the capabilities to be able to achieve that kind of results. Right, I'm going to just look at the chat box and see if there's any questions. Um, I think another reason why fresh graduates didn't get hired is because the company did not give them chance due to the lack of experience. What do you say? So like I mentioned earlier, when a company uses the word experience, it is not only saying that you must have a job related experience. An experience can be by the work of volunteerism that you do. I give you one very simple example. There is floods that has hit the East Coast so badly now. How many young people are now connecting with the different NGOs and becoming volunteers to go flood victims? Now you may ask me, by me helping the flood victims, what experience are you talking about, Mr. Sunil? My dear friend, when you now are a team member of doing a flood or a disaster relief program, you will have to do planning. You will have to think about all the potential risk. You will have to go and figure out where the funding is going to come from. You got to plan. You got to be able to now go and purchase the things that is necessary. You got to plan your logistics. You got to travel there. So safety and security is going to be a concern. You're going to now look into how you're going to plan the logistics there. One little volunteerism activity, abundance of experience. In 2014, when Klantan experienced the worst ever um, floods, right. together with a big group of my friends, right, from the Satya Sai Baba International Organization Malaysia, we actually brought more than 20 ton of food items and all this disaster relief. And we went by boat. We were walking in the mud where the mud is up to our chest level. We actually stayed in one small little hut where 20 people were sleeping. And you know, how do we sleep like this? It's not about the experience of the fun that you have. It is about the planning. We are now going into an area where there's absolutely no place for you to even stay. How are you going to make sure that you have got 20 people that's going to be there safely? How are you going to drive in there using the four wheel drives? How are you going to make sure the safety? How are you going to go and buy your things? How are you going to transport the things? All those experiences matters. When I use the word experience, it is not about employers not giving you opportunity. It is about the young people creating opportunity for themselves to going out there and finding experiences. 2016, I was invited by University of Malaya to give a talk on the similar topic. And the topic back then was the eight secrets of highly employable youth. It was a one full day seminar which I conducted. And I had a couple of you know very vibrant, hungry to learn young people who were in the class who came and sat with me during lunch. And I challenged this group of about five or six of them on my table. And I told them, I'm going to share with you a strategy, a strategy where you don't make money immediately, but you will gain the experience that you say you are being rejected because you don't have. Are you up for that idea? And interesting enough, I actually had that five or six students listen to exactly what I'm going to tell you now. They went out there, they reached out to HR people and volunteered to work for free internship, free working for one to three months. That means when the interview is going on, not only they were trying to sell their skill sets and their capabilities and value that they create, they actually used the exact dialogue I taught them. I told them to say this to the HR. I said, sir, while I know you have got so many people who are looking out, you know, to take up this role, I would like to offer myself to serve and work for your organization for free. I don't want any dollars, sir. I just want an experience. Can you please give me a chance to work with you and learn from you, sir? Exact dialogue, I think about six of them, all right, went and used. And six months later, they created a WhatsApp group, right? Because throughout the whole six months, they were updating me on their progress and all that stuff. Five of them actually got jobs 
and not jobs at low end organizations or jobs that they, these were jobs that they were really excited. And then I called them out for lunch, right? Sometime later and I asked them, what did you do? You know, I wanted to know what was that little thing that they did that worked so well. And then they said, one, offering to add value to an organization without asking for any money or salary at that point of time, because you want to show your capability, you want to prove your value, right? Number two, they said they worked very, very hard to make sure they become so important to the leader. They become so much in demand. We're now letting go of them or saying bye-bye to their staff was not favorable to their boss anymore. So you see, you have a choice. One, to sit and complain that there is no opportunities, there's so much of difficulties, there is so much of struggle. Or number two, to just jump in there, go and talk to some of the HR people who will be happy to give you opportunities, provided you're not asking for anything yet, simply because they don't have the budget, they are not hiring. You know, there's so many reasons why hirings are frozen at this point of time, right? But go and add value. The value that you create will eventually come back to you in the form of an employment. I gave the same piece of advice to the bigger audience because I think at that particular seminar, we had about 150 people, right? It's only the small group of people who eventually did. And today they are holding managerial positions within four years, uh, such a short period of time, they are already holding managerial positions in organizations that clearly shows that they were working very hard. They were hungry to learn. They were continuously sharpening their skill sets and eventually they were seen as a you know, shining star in that organization. So at the end of the day, the one very important word that I want all of you to take back from here is value creation. What is the value that you are creating for the organization that you are willing to work for? As long as you can add value, as long as you are able to give the organization so much of uh, benefits, return on investment, if I could even put it in a business context, the company will always want to continue having you, right? So I hope that answers your question. Um, <coughs> Shazmin, does the person get the message? Yeah, I think. Okay. Right, there's another question here. Um, saya sudah melawat website tata tata suka sebane. Kenapa semua company yang offer job vacancy meletakkan requirement yang tinggi? Can you please share with us um, whoever has uh, posted that question? What were the requirement yang tinggi that you nampak yang ada dalam requirements tu? Because it'll be very interesting to analyze what is the industry asking for and what is the skill sets that you say that you are struggling to show that you have, right? So maybe, uh, Shami, you can inform the person to actually write right. to, uh, examples of the you know um, requirement thingy that they are talking about. Because if a job is suited for a fresh graduate, then the requirements would be standard. And interesting enough, Kalau ada requirement yang tinggi, it will tie back to the soft skills. It will tie back to the attitude, which is actually accessible when we are doing interview sessions. All right. Next question is, is there a chance for non-technical graduates to be hired is low than that of technical graduates? Actually, if you ask me, not so. Just look at this particular slide. Let's not go far, right? The slide that I have you know, shown you, and I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen, right? Digital marketing. So when you talk about you know, uh, non-technical skills, communication skills is one of the most important. Presentation skills is one of the most important. Marketing skills is considered soft skills. So all those skills that you, know, you feel that is, you know, um, non-technical are actually very, very important because some of the technical skills, right, my dear friends, is going to be replaced by machine, right? If those days, right, you need this is an example. 
example okay i was conducting a training in one of the automotive uh, you know companies i don't want to mention name but a big automobile organization in uh, malaysia right so they were manufacturing your dream cars now they needed manual labor with technical skills on how to fix screw move the part do you know after 3 years of doing work for the organization every time i look at the manufacturing area the number of people working there has become lesser why because there is more and more people uh, being replaced by the machine so now suddenly the ma- manual technical work that the engineer or the you know uh, operations guys were doing was now being replaced by a machine which will now fix the part do the screw move the product right however you still need people with great soft skills communication skills problem solving decision making skills leadership skills to go and do selling of the product marketing of the product doing business development for that product so soft skills are very very important amidst the need for us to reinvent ourselves in technical skills so to answer the question you know um, is there a chance of getting um, jobs for non technical graduate is lower i don't think so it's always about what is the skills you have what is the value that you can create for the respective organization that you are working with all right any other questions before i move on jasmi you can just uh, pass the message uh, so far so far don't have uh, any question we can proceed to the next okay all right post covid eight job skills that is necessary right this is by forbes number 1 adaptability and flexibility if we are going to continuously be rigid and if we continue to look for jobs that works our way then we will always be struggling right we need to be very adaptable and we need to be very very flexible in order to be able to get jobs that we are looking for two tech saviness right we need to be technology savvy let's not go very far i myself my dear friends was barely less than 10 days in malaysia 20 days average a month i'm overseas flying from one country to another to conduct trainings to deliver keynote sessions and all that and i was so happy with what i was doing and suddenly comes the time where instead of just working on my powerpoint slides and speaking to people in a classroom or a, you know auditorium or a grand ballroom somewhere i had to now figure out how to handle microsoft teams how to do digital marketing how to now do you know using the zoom as a, so all the different you know to, to learn on moving myself into speaking and doing work online i had to learn within 2 weeks when pandemic happened in march 29 2020 right so technology saviness is the way forward if we don't live up and continuously upskill ourselves in technology we will be left behind so my humble request to all my dear brothers and sisters out there please make sure you continuously become so hungry to learn more and more things and be very very tech savvy right next is creativity and innovation data literacy critical thinking all right you cannot be this person who goes to the office and say yes boss yes boss yes boss yes boss i think gone those days where we can just do yes boss it's now and time where we want to see how every single person that comes into the organization can add so much of value through critical and analytical thinking skills all right digital and coding skills good leadership skills when i talk about good leadership skills is the leadership skills where you are able to influence people team members and all that towards a common vision go back to the example that i shared with you earlier on the klantan flood disaster relief that we worked on all it happened was three friends or three youth leaders came together and we asked ourselves hey people in Sar- in klantan are suffering you know we need to do something within 48 hours 
we got a team of about 30 volunteers who then started looking for the things and funding and all the different kinds of resources that was necessary to be going out there. Leadership is about being able to influence people to come towards a common goal and helping the vision to materialize and manifest. So that sort of you know strong leadership skills is very much needed as we move forward. All right, and emotional intelligence. One in three Malaysians is going through stress and depressions today. My dear friends, stress, depression, frustration is becoming worse because of the environment that we are in. So in order for us to move into employment and really have the job success that we are talking about, emotional intelligence is going to be one very, very powerful skill that we all need. Another research okay, was showing us this different seven uh, skills that's going to be helpful as we move forward. Number one, communication skills. You like it or you don't, communication skills, whether it's verbal, written and listening skills is critical. Analytical and research skills, computer and technical literacy, flexibility, managing multiple important tasks, which is basically prioritization and time management is an important task because you can do a very interesting activity. And I really wish, you know, I and you could have had this interaction and con conversation. You can do an exercise where you take a piece of paper, divide the piece of paper into 24 small little parts. And then for everything that you do in your life, I want you to tear off one hour of that. So for example, you spend four hours on WhatsApp and Facebook. So on that 24 pieces of paper, or rather that one piece of paper with 24 parts, tear off four parts, throw it down on the floor. Say six hours of sleeping, tear, throw it down on the floor. Facebook and Instagram and you know, just doing things that is wasting time, throw on the floor. When you do that exercise, or rather when I did that exercise with 300 young people in Seremban and Kuala Lumpur during a youth session, it was shocking to see that more than 20 hours is just gone in sleeping, which is okay, a productive thing, but the rest of it was on YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, hanging out with friends, lay parking, and doing non-productive things. Suddenly, I mean, after doing that activity, it hit the participants very, very hard that, oh my God, we are wasting our life, right? So you'd be surprised. Being able to juggle and manage and get things done is a very, very important skill, and that's one of them that has been listed there, all right? Problem solving and reasoning ability, all right? Diversity and awareness. So if you realize a lot of the skills, you know, it's not hard skills. We are talking about soft skills. We are talking about people skills, which is easily doable. So my dear friends, the reality of life has to hit you and me. There must be a big paradigm shift right now. Number one, the privileged mindset that, hey, you know, I have got a first class on us. The boss or the, you know, the employer or the manager has to look for me and give me a job. Or oh, number two, right? I can add value to you and that is why I want to work for you. That humility and humbleness is going to be very, very important in this challenging time. It's no more about having the privileged mindset. It is about having the mindset that I want to add value to you Give me an opportunity and this is the value I'll be able to create for you and the organization moving forward. So ladies and gentlemen, you can choose to look at this whole situation from two different possible lenses. One I call the deficit lens, the lens where everything is just not working well, everything is not going well, and the other lens which is appreciative lens that, hey, it's an opportunity for us to upskill. It's an opportunity for us to reskill. It's an opportunity for us to do something different so that we'll be able to achieve greater success, not in the short time, but in the long run. This is another important point. 
many, many young people are always looking for something called instant gratification. Meaning, if today you graduate, immediately you want a job, immediately you want a high salary, immediately we want promotions, and that's never going to happen, right? But what will be very helpful will be something called delayed gratification. So you continuously put in the effort to learn new stuff, gain new you know, connections using technology, which is what I'll share with you later. Continuously build your network, continuously go around adding value to as many people as you can, even though you don't get paid, right? But what will eventually happen is all that little things that you do will receive its benefit. And that is what is meant by delayed gratification. Instant gratification versus delayed gratification. Instant gratification is where today you do something, immediately you want the results. Delayed gratification is you continuously nurture yourself, continuously upskill yourself, continuously add value in people's life. And at the end of the day, when you get the reward, it's going to be a huge big reward compared to someone who does something called instant gratification. Right, um, Shazmi, do we have any questions at the moment? No, sir. Right. All right. Let's go on. This is something called the Ikigai model, which is the Japanese framework or the Japanese concept of helping people discover their ikigai, their reason of being, their purpose of living. We are not born in this world to eat, sleep, work, earn money, have a big house, big car, big wife, and eventually die, you know. We are not supposed to be doing that. And I can tell you that with lots of conviction, only because until the age of 30, while I was doing a lot of work and I was really, really doing well in Petronas, I met in this massive accident where I was driving on the highway at about one o'clock in the morning. I had not slept for four nights and I hit a stationary crane. And at that moment near Panchalaling when the accident happened, right? I managed to get out of the car, but the car was absolutely total loss. And miraculously, I had absolutely no scratch on my body. Not a single drop of blood came out from my body. So from being that young, hungry, instant gratification character who wanted big bonus, who wanted to buy a house and this and that, all that you know, material things that was running through me, it dawned upon me that, hey, there is a bigger purpose of my life. There must be more to my life. That's why I was able to survive. And that's why I was meant to be alive. I took one whole month to really reflect on my life. What was I looking for? What was I looking for? What's my purpose? You know, I went deeper and deeper into a self-discovery mode. And of course, that is where I discovered this concept called Ikigai. And my dear brothers and sisters, the purpose of my life have then shifted from wanting to work hard and becoming rich and having lots of money to, to empowering and enriching lives of people, to touch as many hearts as possible and to transform as many people's lives as possible. That becomes my mission ever since that incident six years ago, rather seven years ago now, right? So Ikigai is at a state where your purpose of life your reason of life, the reason you wake up every morning is so clear, right? So Ikigai is this powerful combination of passion, mission, profession, and vocation. So you do what you are good at. You do what you love to do. You get paid for to do what you are good at. And you do what the world needs. And once you reach the state of discovering your ikigai, you will find that mandi tak basa, makan tak kenyang. You know, you reach that state where you are so, you know, engrossed in doing all that things where nothing matters more because you are so excited to do and live your passion. And in this era where gig economy is the future, gig economy is the way forward, I would always encourage young, vibrant people like all of you 
to go and discover what is your passion? How do you do that? By asking a couple of questions like this. What is it that you really love to do? Put aside, you know, skills, put aside your degree, put aside all the other things. Just think about it. Apa yang you betul-betul suka buat? Right? Right? What is it are you good at? Eh, I pandai masak lah. When I masak, my mother says the cooking very good lah. My sister say the food very tasty lah. Ah, that's one extra skill that you have, right? And then, what can you be paid for? What is it that, you know, little, little things that you do and you have that people may be able to pay you for? And at the end of the day, how will what you are doing create a positive impact in the world? The moment you can discover this, you will be surprised that you are no longer living a life of yourself, of what the society expects of you, but it is the life that you live because you love to do what you're doing. You are creating so much of positive effect and you're eventually able to make ends meet, earn a decent living because you are living your passion. So that is what this is, right? If you want, you can take a picture of this slide and be able to, you know, reflect upon this during the MCO which starts tomorrow. Tolonglah duduk di rumah, Jangan pergi mana-mana. So while you are sitting down in the house, instead of you wasting your time on social media and you know all this uh, Facebook and all that, I would highly encourage you to get a nice cup of coffee and start asking all these difficult questions to yourself. You'll be surprised how these questions may shape your life and give you newer perspectives, right? So let me take a question. Um, if I were to do the strategy you shared just now, how should I approach HR people? Is by emailing them appropriate and effective in this COVID situation? Very good question. My dear friends, are you aware, other than Facebook, there is a very, very powerful professional networking platform called LinkedIn? When I did my run, um, sometime in January and February, going and giving talks to all the different you know, universities in Malaysia. When I asked the question, how many of you are aware of LinkedIn? Less than 50% of the people actually responded and said, yes, they know what LinkedIn is. And even if they knew what LinkedIn was, they never actively got themselves you know, writing and connecting with people on LinkedIn. So the first secret which I would like to encourage you to start working on, again, this MCO is going to be a golden opportunity for you to do that, is to now come up with a good LinkedIn profile, write your achievement, write and share your credentials, write short, short notes or art, what do you call articles and you know write-ups and you will slowly attract traction. In LinkedIn, you can go and connect with HR people. You can connect with recruiters. And yes, you can use the strategy that I shared with you by writing to HR people directly using LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a professional networking platform which you can use to connect with almost all, if not probably at least 60% of the top leaders in the world are connected on LinkedIn. So leverage on LinkedIn to start connecting with leaders, HR people, recruiters, and that would be a perfect platform for you to start sharing your wisdom, sharing your experiences, doing short write-ups, and sharing your stories to inspire people. You will get noticed. And that's one that's coming from me, a person who was not on LinkedIn. After I was advised to get connected on LinkedIn, I decided to follow the advice of a friend of mine. And two years later, I was one of the 100 top LinkedIn influencers. Without me even realizing, without me even aiming for the recognition or what, all I used to do is put up whatever I'm doing and I share the key learnings. What you share in there is also important. If you are now you know, out with your friend and having a nice cup of coffee, no need to post a picture of you having the coffee. You can post five things that you learn from the conversation with your friend, three things that will help other people benefit from reading what you have written. So Facebook, you will post a picture with your friend with a selfie and say, hey, you know, having fun with a long lost friend of mine. LinkedIn, 
you don't post that same. You can post the same picture, but what you write as a description will be different. What you write there will be key takeaways, key learning points, and that's what other people will benefit from your reading. So that's what you should do. There are a couple of very good LinkedIn influencers that you should actually start reaching out to. Go and start connecting with people on LinkedIn and see how you are able to build your network moving forward, right? So that's to respond to the question that just came in. Having said whatever I shared with you, dear friends, remember success follows a Pareto rule. The rule is 20% skills and 80% attitude, all right? By changing the attitude that we have, we will be able to change our lives, all right? Remember, 20% skills, 80% attitude. Attitude is going to be your key success factor. Change your attitude, you will be able to see success. Let me leave you, right, uh, with a 4D formula for success. Number one, decision. Two, direction. Three, destination and four discipline make a decision on what do you really want in your life make a decision on exactly how and what are you going to do and set the direction for yourself have clarity on the destination that you want to go to and none of this 3d is ever going to be successful if you and i do not have discipline in our lives so discipline is going to be the ultimate golden key to making the decision whether you become successful or not. When I use the word discipline, even though you have no job, do you still wake up early? Do you still do some reading? Do you still you know, spend maybe two hours on LinkedIn? Do you still do, you know, review your CV and keep enhancing your CV and start connecting with more people and sending out? Or do you now go to sleep and then you wake up at 12 o'clock and then you have your lunch and then you go and hang out with your friends. And then you, you see a disciplined life versus, you know, tida apa kind of lifestyle. That's going to be a big difference in your success. Discipline, direction, destination, which must come with discipline, right? So these are the five things which I would like to, you know, sort of summarize and share with you as the secrets for you becoming highly employable in your life as you move forward. Number one, be very positive, be very, very ambitious, and be driven, right? In other words, be hungry. And this will also mean that you got to be hungry for experiences, got to be hungry for skills. Malaysian government, through all the various agencies like MDEC, HRDF, Perkeso, and so many others are now investing hundreds of millions to empower young people, empower retrenched workers with more skills. So opportunity is given. But the question is, are you hungry enough to grab that opportunity? Are you now running after from one program to another program? Are you going on to Coursera, right? because there are thousands of courses there that is free, which MDAC is offering us. How many certification programs have you completed? How many courses have you enrolled yourself and successfully completed? See, don't go and complain that government is not doing anything. Government is doing a lot. Compared to many other government leaders that I work with, I think Malaysian government is doing tremendous for human capital development in this country. The question is, are you hungry enough to grab those opportunities, right? So number one is always be very, very hungry. Number two, read. Read and read. Our previous Prime Minister, Tun Dr. Mahathir, at the age of 95, he is so sharp. And when he was interviewed by the media back then, he said he spends a lot of time reading. He wakes up early and he reads. Reading is no longer a culture in our country. But if you now travel to countries like Europe, Australia, in Malaysia, when you go onto the trains, 
you see everybody looking at their mobile phones. But when you go into these other countries, like I was mentioning just now, you actually see people sitting in a train with a book, right? So when you read, you expand your horizon, you read, you get more possibilities, you get newer ideas, and you just can do so much when you keep reading. Read is tip number two, which I would like to leave you with. Number three, everyone has got a mobile phone. Everyone's mobile phone has got all the different kind of possible apps and access to internet. With a laptop and with a mobile phone, you can literally rock the world. So the choice is in your hands. What do you do with the device that you have in your hand? Do you sit and keep you know, uh, wasting time on social media like Facebook or Instagram? Or are you now going into the different websites to read more, to learn more, to see the global trends, to see where the world is evolving, to now go and use this technology that you have to learn and upskill yourself, right? So tip number three is to leverage on technology to continuously learn more, apply those skills more. And even if you are very, very hungry to grow, you might be surprised by you now going into YouTube and learning certain skills on YouTube, you might be able to market yourself. You might be uh, you know, able to go and market your skills. Simple example, I was struggling for at least over what, three years or so, finding freelance designers, freelance video editors, freelance graphic recording people. And it's still a struggle till today, yeah? We cannot seem to get people who are genuinely good at that skill. And even if they are good at that skill, they are probably extremely expensive. Or if they are good at that skill, they have got a horrible attitude where they work with you one time very well. And then the second time what they do is they'll pass the job to somebody else and then they no longer become responsible and accountable to the quality of work. Simple opportunities are available. Whether we want to take the time to learn up the new skills, right? Using technology again, like I said, and using them to generate revenue for yourself for survival, it's a choice, right? Third, we are in a difficult environment. Times are difficult, situation is challenging, right? What do you do? You know that you would want a job that pays you a good 6,000, 7,000, 10,000, 20,000. And I tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, when I was working in Petronas earning 2,510 ringgit as a starting salary, I was so happy in life. And then when I worked for 10 years in Petronas and the salary hit 10,000, I realized suddenly my hutang piutang is increasing. So there is never a time in your life where you will find that what you are earning is enough. And that's one mistake that we are doing as young people. And this is a reminder even to myself. If you earn 3,000 ringgit, spend 2,000 ringgit, 1,000 ringgit, put it in savings. Bank Negara recently came up with a statement where 25% of young people are actually filing for bankruptcy because they cannot afford to manage during these difficult times and challenges. So take this opportunity to really reflect back and have clarity between what are your needs in life and what are your wants in life. Put the ones for a later time, focus on your basic needs and do anything. Geek economy is, like I said, the way forward. Little things that you can do to generate small amounts of money that can fulfill your ones. So be very clear between your needs and your ones. Getting the latest iPhone 12 is a want. Having a mobile phone in your hand to email and WhatsApp and communicate with you know HR people, you know um, recruiters and all that is a need. So be very clear between the needs and the ones. And the last but not least, which is think out of the box. My dear friends, while you and I are trained to become employees, there is nothing that can stop us in life to become employers. Think of what is the need of the hour. Think of what 
are the kind of solutions that you can possibly come up with which will help the world. And by doing that, you may end up starting something called a social enterprise, which is a social enterprise is one where you are doing community work, helping people and all that, but you get paid to do it so that you can manage your costs. The objective is to serve the society. However, the opportunity is also there for you to recover some money and have some savings. There are a lot of young people today who comes up with brilliant ideas and be able to start small little entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship initiatives and are living a decent life. You may not become a millionaire overnight, but if you put your heart and soul into it and you believe in what you're doing and you work really, really hard to it, there is possibilities of anything that can come. The sky will be a limit at that point of time. So think out of the box, do things differently and see what you could do to make yourself more relevant, make yourself more marketable, make yourself earn that income that you need for your livelihood. All right. So in summary, like I mentioned, number one, be hungry for new skills and new normal lifestyle. Read stories of, you know, wrecks to riches, biographies of failures and successful people. Go get new knowledge. Leverage on technology, like I said, you know, connect with people, be very curious, add more value through sharing of your knowledge and wisdom, right? Be clear on the purpose of your life, right? On your needs that you want. And finally, think out of the box, right? 25% of SMEs in the country are on the verge of closing down. What can you as a graduate, what can you as a young person who has access to knowledge, information, and, you know, resource, do to help these companies go in give your ideas work with them come up with solutions help them pivot the business these are all the things you could possibly do to survive in this challenging time all right ladies and gentlemen if there is any questions i would love to take that okay there's one question here what is your suggestion for a phd student that ask for high salary when applying for job, what should the range be? Wow. So if you talk about uh, salary range for PhD holders, question will be, is it with experience or without experience? If you have a PhD with no job experience, you are probably looking at anything between 4,000 to 10,000 ringgit. There are certain organizations in Malaysia, they do not even recognize your masters, right? I have friends who did their masters, their MBA, masters in management and all that, and there was no salary jump. What they were earning is what they were earning. So a starting sort of asking salary for a PhD holder, I guess might be a good idea for you to start with about 6K to 10K. Again, it goes back to skills, past experiences, capabilities, need of the skills that you are providing. So there's so many variables when you talk about salary and it's very difficult to just pinpoint and tell you exactly one particular answer. But I hope that range of six to 10 gives you a, you know, sort of a benchmark, All right? Any other questions that I can be helpful with before we wrap up for today? Is okay, it audience? Yeah. Any any question from audience? Okay, so there is a very good question here. Is it best for an employee to take study leave to further studies? Now, that's a very tricky one, um, but this is going to be my view, which comes from my own experience. Again, I was working in Petronas. I was doing my side hustle, which is my training and consulting, you know, on a part-time basis during the same time. And I was also doing my master's. It took a toll on my life. I used to wake up at four o'clock and go to sleep at 12 o'clock. And I don't think that has really changed even now, right? But I managed to complete my master's while doing part-time. You could actually take full time off, especially if you're doing PhD, right? And you have difficulty juggling between, you know, your family, 
your studies and also your work, you may want to take, you know, time off. When you take time off, the only question you must be able to answer is, can you afford to pay your bills? Right? I'm being very, very practical. Give me an option. I would love to pursue my PhD and totally, you know, stop doing anything for four years. But the question will be, can I pursue my PhD now and choose not to work at all? Do I have that kind of financial resources? Do I have a scholarship? Even if I have scholarship, do I have bills to pay? Because scholarship may be able to pay off my study loans and, you know, uh, my accommodation and whatsoever not. But how about my family expenditure? How about my housing loan? How about my electricity bills? So option one will always be to go full time on study mode. But then the question you must answer to yourself will be, can you afford to take a full uh, career break and pursue your studies? If you can afford it, if you are financially, you know, able to, uh, what do you call, manage, then go for it. If you can't, then hustle is the word, right? Wake up early, do your exams and do your assessments and do your studies and assignments. Go to work, finish work, come back, continue studying. And I guess, you know, in two years time, you'll be giving a pat on your back and say, hey, good job done for being able to juggle. All right. Um, there's another question over here. Um, what is the best? Joining graduate employability training or finding a stable job? Going in for graduate employability trainings will definitely give you additional skills and make you more employable. So in the event you cannot get a full uh, employment at this point of time, grab the graduate employability trainings and see how that new set of skills and knowledge could actually help you moving forward. Yeah, so that's to answer the question on um, joining graduate employability training and finding a stable job. Shami, how much more time do we have? We have uh, around five to six minutes. Okay, perfect. Right. Are there any other questions that you are seeing on the... Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, Talent Cop has come up with an excellent initiative that is actually helping a lot of young people, right, to gain more clarity, to get connected to resources and all that through their initiative called Kesa Siswa. Now, HRDF, in collaboration with the Malaysia Positive Psychology Association and, of course, MapTech, where I am involved, right, we are also offering free career coaching. So this, you know, are the different resources that is available to you in the event you want to now reach out to professionals who can help you for free. They don't charge you even a dollar. All you need to do is just reach out to them and register yourself. You will be given a professional coach whom you can connect and have conversations with. This is the article. If you want, you can actually take down the link, right, uh, where I was interviewed by the Star newspaper and I shared on the five tips for job seekers post COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, achieving personal excellence is not about the skill, but it's about the attitude. And therefore, success and excellence is not skills, but it is attitude, like I've repeatedly mentioned in this entire session today, right? Winners don't do things, don't do different things, they do things differently, right? I wish you all the very, very best, and I sincerely hope that this session has been helpful to give you some ideas, some clarity, some food for thought, some question marks for you to respond to. And if there's anything I could be of help, do reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I am Sunil Hashmukare, and you can get on LinkedIn with me, and I'll be happy to help you out in any way possible. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Stay safe. Okay. Stay All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sunil Hasmukhere, for the uh, answer, for uh, answer the question, for the amazing sharing, for the great tips. Uh, it was a pleasure and it's an uh, honor to have you with us. 
So uh, to all the participants, uh, stay tuned for the next special season from Proton uh, uh, about an automotive industry outlook. All right. Uh, have a blessed day. Stay safe. Protect yourself. Thank you. And Assalamualaikum. <laughs>